Today I want to talk to you about icing. Mmm, icing. No, not like that. In December, users on Reddit started posting and responding to pictures of pickup trucks and other vehicles parked in or blocking electric vehicle charging stations. The pictures were accompanied by stories of verbal harassment from the truck drivers, and the trend quickly became known as icing. So what is icing? Is this a new thing? And why would people do something like this? The term icing comes from internal combustion engines, since drivers of traditional gasoline burning vehicles seem to be harassing electronic vehicle or EV drivers. So how does an icing event end? In most cases, the drivers of the offending vehicles are removed by property owners. Since electric vehicle charging stations are usually at businesses like gas stations, it's easy for the owners to cite trespassing issues and get the truck drivers to leave. Blocking EV charging stations with non-EVs is also illegal in several states, so if an icing doesn't stop when the property owner gets involved, there's also the possible recourse of calling the police. But these are just a few weird isolated events, right? Unfortunately not. They're examples of a pattern of behavior that's been emerging for a while. Before icing started, there was rolling coal. Interestingly, both behaviors start with large pickup trucks, but in the case of rolling coal, they're specifically diesel trucks with engines that have been home modified to dump extra fuel into their cylinders. Technically, this practice does provide more horsepower and torque for the trucks, but it also means there's unburned fuel in the engines that's exhausted as big plumes of black smoke. While a truck owner might say they've modified their diesel engine in this way in order to gain the benefits to torque and horsepower, the name is a dead giveaway that this behavior has a lot more to do with being intentionally bad for the environment. Rolling coal is illegal at the level of federal law because it violates the Clean Air Act. It's also illegal in several states, including Illinois, Colorado, New Jersey, and Maryland. But while driving around in a modified truck releasing plumes of black smoke is cool, aiming that smoke at Tesla and Prius vehicles and their drivers is apparently cooler. So harassing electric vehicle drivers or even just pro-environmental people in general isn't a new thing. And the harassment seems to be going beyond verbal to include actual intentional physical behaviors. What's going on here? This isn't a straight up environmental issue. It's a mental, social, behavioral, and ideological issue. So let's dive into the psychology and sociology of pro and anti-environmental behaviors. There's been quite a bit of research, some of which I've covered before, about what it takes to inspire someone to act in environmentally friendly or green ways, like driving an EV instead of an ICE vehicle. People are more likely to be in favor of green practices if they're better educated on the subject, but that in no way guarantees that they'll actually behave in corresponding ways. To put it another way, knowledge isn't power. Studies in the US have found that increased knowledge of scientific and environmental topics can actually lead to more polarized views on things like climate change rather than less polarized. It seems that all of this has more to do with motivations and ideology than the facts you know. Let's start with motivations. How do we motivate people to engage in green behaviors? We could try financial incentives, but those usually have the drawback of only motivating people to do that one specific action rather than becoming more green overall. This can also lead to a problem called compensatory beliefs. Basically, this is the idea that doing one right thing excuses doing one wrong thing. Like, if I have vegetables as part of my dinner, I can have a whole batch of cupcakes for dessert, right? When it comes to green behaviors, this means that someone who recycles might think that behavior excuses them taking 30 minute long showers every day. Motivation is also about cost benefit analyses. So how inconvenient is a green behavior to do and how much benefit will I gain from it? This is the part where we need to remember that humans can be really bad at calculating delayed gratification and delayed consequences. What sorts of immediate benefits can you receive from engaging in a green behavior? Apart from all of the obvious health and financial benefits, of course. It might gain you the approval of your social group, which is a theme we'll come back to again. But in short, we humans like to feel like we belong. So if you identify as a pro-environmental person, then your behaviors are much more likely to match. Participating in a green behavior might let you feel like you have the moral high ground. This certainly feels good, but it can 
also be very off-putting, which might be a minor motivation for people in the opposition. Similarly, a behavior might signal your increased status, like how Tesla electric vehicles are also expensive luxury cars. Again, feels good, but can seem obnoxious to other people. Finally, you might feel motivated to act in pro-environmental ways because it's the norm. There's that feeling of belonging again. Conversely, you could also think about being green as being exclusive. For example, relatively few people drive electric rather than gasoline vehicles. And these last two ideas have their twins on the opposite side of the ideological spectrum. Being actively anti-environmental might seem like the norm, because most people don't engage in that many green behaviors. But anti-environmentalists also see themselves as the underdogs in the fight against hippie, greeny, socialist liberals. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Basically, what all of these motivations tell us is that how we make decisions about green or anti-green behaviors has way more to do with whether or not the information we have resonates with our personal beliefs and those of our social groups. It's relatively easy for us to reject information and behaviors that don't fit with our personal worldviews. So we've looked at why people would actively choose to, or passively choose not to, adopt renewable energy and green behaviors. But icing and rolling coal aren't passive reactions, they're active opposition. So what motivates people into these sorts of behaviors? Behaviors. I really want to stress that this isn't about apathy. Sure, there are lots of people in our society who can't be bothered to think about going green in any way for a variety of reasons, but apathy is the passive refusal I mentioned. What we're looking at here is active, vitriolic, and angry, and it concerns me. We like to think of ourselves as rational thinking creatures, but that's just not the case. What do you mean? It's not. What I mean is, when we're faced with situations that are new, different, or stressful, we're much more likely to fall back on our emotions and visceral reactions than we are to calmly think our way through. That's why we tend to rely on our political identities to shape a lot of our opinions and reactions. We use our minds more for rationalizing our preconceptions than honestly evaluating our opinions. And before you start complaining about scientists talking about politics, let's remember that politics is just code for how we we think about the world, which naturally has to include science and scientists. Moving on! Being anti-environment seems to be about having a particular mindset. For example, remember how I said we humans are bad at dealing with delayed consequences? An anti-environment mindset would include thinking that climate change is a future problem rather than a current one. We also tend to be bad at realizing the direct or personal consequences of our actions and behaviors. So an anti-environmental mindset might include thinking that. I mean, the results of climate change won't really happen to me. That'll be someone else's problem. And because we just can't get away from this idea, the anti-environmental mindset is also about fitting in with our political and social identity groups. If you're still not sold on this idea, think back to the anguish of not fitting in during high school and you'll see what I mean. For many of us, it's a nightmare to think about the possibility of being left out or ostracized from our groups, and that can make us do some strange things. An article written by Aaron Brew and James Wilkie in Scientific American recently addressed another important social group whose members may feel like being pro-environmental shouldn't be part of their identity. The article mentioned that men who feel they've been emasculated for some reason may try to reassert their masculinity by deliberately making decisions that are bad for the environment. On top of that, apparently green behaviors like using cloth bags instead of plastic at the grocery store are seen by both men and women as being feminine. The article goes on to recommend that advertisers and activists use more men environment mentally friendly language and imagery when describing products and behaviors so men aren't scared away from doing the right thing. There's one more layer to all of this group identity stuff, though. Brace yourselves for more politics! Some people have labeled the group of behaviors that includes icing and rolling coal as the anti-reflexivity movement, and noted that, at its heart, the movement seems to focus on defending the industrial capitalist system. That seems crazy, though! Though, right? I mean, these guys are just being obnoxious with their trucks. They don't have any big geopolitical motivations behind what they're doing, do they? Well, they might not, but the leaders of their social and ideological groups do. If you've heard of the Koch brothers, and you probably have, you know that their money and influence are embedded in a lot of places. Their special interest groups spend a lot of time lobbying the government at all levels in order to maintain their version of the status quo. Stick to 
to the status quo. What? Anyway, the Koch brothers' influence goes far beyond government lobbying. They also do their best to try to influence voter opinions directly through shoddy researchers, op-eds in newspapers, and posts on social media. This flood of information from these seemingly distinct but actually connected sources can make the clan of belonging seem artificially larger and more powerful, which may inspire the bullying we're seeing. Advertising is effective at swaying people's thoughts and emotions. There's a reason hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on it every year. The idea of supporting industrial capitalism does trickle its way back down into the example behaviors we started with, though. Hating on hybrid and electric vehicles may be a manifestation of hating on renewable energy in general, as a direct response to Donald Trump's negative attitude toward electric vehicles and vocal promises to save the coal industry. I suppose they may not have thought about how their rolling coal vehicles don't actually run on coal, they run on petroleum petroleum gasoline, but the electricity used to charge an EV could conceivably be made by burning coal. At this point, I hope you're wondering what we can do about issues that are so fraught with emotion but have the environment and our future hanging in the balance. I'm sorry to say that there's no one clearly right, always effective, easy answer, but here are some things to consider. Since almost all of this goes back to personal identity and sense of belonging to a group, some people have suggested calling out behavioral inconsistencies as a way to motivate people to act more green. However, I would suggest extreme caution with this strategy because it is so likely to backfire. We humans hate to admit when we're wrong, so being told we're hypocrites often makes us cling even more tightly to our bad behaviors and engage in mental gymnastics to rationalize them. So maybe don't try to hurt people's feelings. Instead, we can try a related approach and remind a person of all of their green behaviors as a way to strengthen their self-identity as a pro-environmental person. See, you already use LEDs and take shorter showers because they save you money, but they're also good for the environment, so maybe electric cars aren't so bad, right? Right? All jokes aside, there is one strategy that I firmly believe in. Role models and leaders are incredibly important to the way our society functions. They set the tone and behaviors for almost all social groups, for better or for worse. So if you can be a leader in your community, whether that's your family, your neighborhood, your place of employment, or your whole town, embrace that power and model good behaviors. You can show others that it's easy and beneficial to be green, and hopefully they'll follow your example. What do you think about all of the research behind motivations to be pro or anti-environmental? Have you seen anybody icing or rolling coal? I'd love to hear what you think about these issues down in the comments. If you liked this video, don't forget to like it! If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll be presenting at the South by Southwest Education Conference at the beginning of March, so if you'll be an Austin then, come say hi! On March 14th, I'll be doing a live stream of my master's thesis defense right here on YouTube, so stay tuned for that. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. I'm Walter Cronkite.